you were talking about flash and uh, this parallelization, how to create parallelization products from the flash. Our app already for the presentation and lecture today is the best person as far as characterization of material content. So the last lecture, last thing about all these is the material, okay? This is what we are discussing. So parallelization of industrial waste is how to create valuable products out of this material and for which characterization is very important. So to answer your question, this talk of today is very, very useful. Fine. Let's proceed. So I'm Nevin Koshi. Uh, I've been working the past few years on the topic of uh, fly ash, the alkali activation of fly ash for geo environmental applications. Uh, so today I'll just give you an overview of fly ash and characterization, the different characterization methods, uh, synthesis of uh, zeolites from fly ash uh, as time permits. So what, what do you know about fly ash? What is fly ash? It's a byproduct from, yeah, burning of coal. Yeah, coal, it's a coal combustion byproduct. So what do you know about fly ash? What's special about it? Why is it a hot issue now? Yeah, it's used in cement. Yeah. So fly ash is generated over 160 million tons of fly ash is generated every year in India because India, the uh, total power generation, uh, about 66% of it is coal based, which means we are producing a lot of fly ash, which needs to be utilized. So here comes uh, the need for uh, finding uh, applications for this fly ash, how we can use it. So before we can use any material, we need to know uh, what the property of the material it is. Otherwise, you'll be do just hitting out in the dark. You won't know what you're doing. So you need, if you know what the material is, then you can at least relate it with something else. And you can see that since it has this property, I can use it for this, uh, this purpose. Like that, you can find out. So here, fly, I'll just, so yeah, this is a picture showing the fly ash disposal. So fly ash is disposed in uh, a few different methods. Ways so one one way is in which you just dump it on on land itself and you produce huge uh, dumps like this landfills of fly ash. So in India, as you know that land is not so so much uh, available, or you could say that land is precious to us. So we can't uh, waste precious land uh, surrounding the thermal power plants by just dumping this over there. Plus, fly ash is also very a uh, very fine. Uh, material, so it's microfine material. So, which means that if it starts flying around, it is not good for health. Health also. So, I'll just. This is the chemical composition of fly ash. Chemical composition means that what is, what are the different chemicals, what are the different elements present in the fly ash. So, this we determine using X-ray fluorescence technique. X-ray X-ray fluorescence. Have you heard of it? XRF. X-ray fluorescence technique will help us uh, in 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 this technique you bombard the material by any any powder material that you mix it with a suitable binder in this case generally we use a methyl cellulose binder and we bind the material and we press it into a pallet form and then we use x-ray fluorescence uh, technique to know what are the oxide metal oxides present in the material so you get the co composition of the metal oxide composition of any material that you Put in the uh, well, you that you give for XRF analysis. So, Technique. 
these other devices they will compact in every unit you can have one of that product. These are samples of the materials, what you are talking about, how to prepare a sample. And very quickly it gives you results like this. It's just like your blood report, you know. You go to any uh, what do you call it? Hospital or somewhere, that's all me. What do they do? They will very quickly take your sample and they will test the they will diagnose it. So this is nothing but advanced diagnostics of the material. Yes. Each and every oxide which is present in the system it speaks of its own. That's what this material would be. So you must be seeing here silica is 62 percent. Now silica mostly is in the inert form. Fine. Alumina is 35 percent. These are indicative values. Iron is 6.6. Yes. Calcium is 1.4. So you are talking about photonic material. A photonic material should have lot of calcium in it. The human body requires a lot of calcium, is it not? To make your bones strong. The logic is same. A material which does not contain calcium cannot be a good cementing material because the cement chemistry which is responsible for creating concrete will not occur if calcium oxide is extremely less. So by conducting a simple test like XRF, you can immediately decide how I should use this material. Does this answer your question? It doesn't take much time and you get results which can be useful in taking a decision about this application. As a geotechnical engineer, I will be very happy to use a material where silica is more because I won't require in any circumstances a situation where you know porosity of soil is required as such. I would require soil as a fill material. Low lying areas are there, water block. I will dump soil on this, compact it. I have created a pad on which I can construct soil. Soil particles need not to, you know, get interlocked with each other chemically or mineralogically. When you are compacting them, they are just getting interlocked mechanically. Fine. So porosity is not required. As a geotechnical engineer, my perception would be different than a concrete technologist who is looking after too much of calcium into the system. Do you realize this? So now we have two strategies of utilizing the material. If silica is more, we call this material as siliceous. If calcium is more, we call this material as calcareous. Clear? More of calcium. Now, yesterday we were talking about dredging and reclamation related things. So most of you are talking about sands. Most of them the sand is brought from the water bodies, particularly marine environment. That means sand being only siliceous is okay, very good. Or if sand contains a lot of calcium into it, it shows that the sand is coming out of the marine deposit offshore. And this might not be a good material for killing purpose. Because chances are in the due course of time, calcium oxide might disintegrate. So when you are using sand for reclamation, based on dredging, seashells and calcium oxide should not be present in it. I will be telling the difference in the strategy, the way the strategy is created. So this is the, you know, the differentiation of material characteristics can be done based on its chemical composition. So chemical composition is number one. The moment you have done this, you have a 50 percent idea about what to do with this material. Now go back to the previous slide. What he has shown here is, it's a power plant. A lot of cooling towers are there. And there's a big mast. Just beneath the big mast, there will be a boiler room. Coal is pulverized and it is injected into the furnace. In any village, you know, must have noticed people fire their uh, kitchen, you know, stoves. Chula, we call it in villages. 
anything which you burn will result in ash. Be it wood, be it coal. The problem is very at small level, is it not? You are burning, let's say, one kg of coal to cook for four people. Ash content will be, say, hardly 100 grams. You can dispose it of next door. Now, think of a situation like this where millions of tons of the coal is being incinerated every day. Fine. And depending upon from where the coal is brought or what is the calorific value of the coal and what is the ash content of the coal, the amount of ash is going to get generated. Most of the Indian coals would have ash content about 30%. Fine. Each gram of the coal or one kg of the coal which you are incinerating will produce 300 gram or 40 gram of the ash. And hence all the problem starts. Now the question is how should I dispose the dry ash? As he was talking about there are two concepts. One is you do the dry disposal. So I don't know whether you have visited any thermal uh, power plant or not. In thermal power plants, they have silos. In silos, they store dry ash. Trucks come with big, big you know, containers attached to them. Silos are opened automatically and the truck gets filled up with the dry ash. This is a way to dispose dry ash in a dry form. When you are doing dry disposal, water does not come in contact with the dry ash. And hence, the calcium oxide which is present in it does not get destroyed. And hence, whenever you are doing dry disposal of the fly ash, it can be directly sent to the cement plant. 36 to 40 percent of the cement can be replaced by the fly ash directly. You got the point? Second is, fly ash is very coarse. There is no calcium in it it becomes a real botheration. Now this is where he was talking about aerology in the last class. Mix it with water and throw it at a certain distance in a pond. These are known as lagoons. Water seeps out slowly and slowly and particles of the fly ash remain there. Okay. So whenever you get a chance, please visit uh, Dhanu power plant or whatever, Koradi or wherever you can get a chance to see. These ponds will be huge ponds in acres of land and the depth of the ponds would be 10 meters, 20 meters. So one of the issues in environmental geotechnics is, and this is where a big question is, as he said rightly, land is limited. Yes. Now power plant has to run for 20 years or 50 years. When you are disposing fly ash in this form, what will happen slowly and slowly? All the ponds will get filled up. Now what are you going to do? Are you going to shut down the power plant? So this is where the big question mark is. Now this is where you have to develop a strategy. So one of the strategies would be, what comes to your mind? What can be done now? So all the lagoons have filled up with the fly ash. Now what should you do? Close down the power plant or what else? It's a big question. Now this is where geological engineering comes handy. One of the answers to solve this problem would be, I can create a second layer or second tier ash pond system on the existing ash ponds. Clear? So I can raise the height of the containment system and I can use it for another 10-20 years. Now the question would be once this is also exhausted, what you are going to do? But please remember, the more and more you go above the ground, this being a dry powder, earthquake is going to be a big problem, liquefaction is going to be a big problem and so on. So this is where the geotechnics of disposed material comes into the picture. So you have talked about shear strength parameters, compressibility, you know, and consolidation characteristics and so on. All those tools or parameters become very important in designing these type of systems. These are known as ash disposal systems.
So that stuff is a very different science. So we were talking about filter design in the previous lecture, DW, 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 and all those things. So when you are disposing something in a study form, you want water to seep out through the containment, leaving the particles there. So that means you have to design the bunts of the ash pond in such a manner that they act as a filter. So these are the issues which are associated with all this. So the question comes, can I use this ash which is lying in the ponds, in the lagoons? Because the dry form has already been used by the cement industry. That's not an issue. And the moment they mix it with the cement, Organa cement, sorry, uh, your uh, OPC, ordinary Portland cement, it becomes PPC. Ports Portland. 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 That problem sorted out. So the issue is that you can see that stream of water coming out of the pond and the water is getting deposited over here. Unfortunately, when you do this type of disposal, calcium oxide gets hydrated and material loses its organicity. This can be used as a good fill material, a structural fill material. So the point is that Indian Railways is trying to expand so much and bullet trains and all these things, projects are being launched. The big question is from where you are going to bring this land, this is soil, for making embankments. One of the answers is that this material can be utilized as a good fill material. Anytime you go to Delhi, Okhla Bridge, that was the first project which was done in India by using the fly ash as a fill material in the retaining walls. Those of you who have done soil mechanics, you will realize that the density of this material is very very low. So active earth pressures which are going to get induced in this material on the wall are going to be extremely small. But because we will show you subsequently, each particle is a sphere of silica or quartz this crushing strength is very high. Yes? So particles won't crush. So these are the attributes of this material. Any question? Like in case of fly ash or other type of material, the what covalency what plays a role is silica, not the calcium. Because silica reacts with CHL is produced. No, dear, you are absolutely wrong. Please remove all these misconceptions from your mind. Silica is, by virtue of its nature, silica is not a reactive material unless it is in amorphous form. So when you say silica, you are talking about crystalline form or amorphous form. You have extra examples? Yes. Okay, this is where we will show you the difference between the form of the material itself. A crystalline material will never react with anything unless you bring in contact this material with some acids or bases or some other chemical. So silica dissolution is something which you are talking about which gives activity to silica. Clear? That time I will talk about this issue. So silica gets dissolved in hydroxide. Look at this. You have sodium oxide, Na2O and K2O. Potassium oxide. So the moment these two oxides come in contact with water, they create hydroxides. Now these hydroxides have tendency to eat up silica. Etching of silica. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to show that because here there is this issue. And then silica particles becomes reactive. Then only CHN analysis takes place. Yes, not before that. So silica by virtue of being a passive material, if it is in crystalline form, is a good material for filling purpose, not for cementitious purpose. In some amount, like not what we told 60 to 30, but around 30 to 40 percent is present. No, you can't say like that. So, for that, you have to do another test. We'll talk about that. All right. So, my idea of showing you this analysis was that's what I said 50 percent indications are that this material can be used for this purpose. Clear? Yeah? It's a preliminary test. It gives an idea about 
whether this metal can be used for this or not, or this or not. Clear? Elimination. So, this is how the material is characterized based on its chemical composition. Gel formation, another thing which you have studied in your completed module course. Now, suppose if I ask you to become a champion in extraction of titanium, look at this. Titanium is a precious material. Unfortunately, no research has been done in India to extract titanium from the biosh, and titanium is a very, very precious material. Similarly, vanadium, or even manganese. Where do you find manganese mostly in nature? Manganese always comes in the form of noodles. It's a very, very rare thing. You know, there are few guys in the country who only um, do culture of manganese noodles. Manganese is always in the offshore environment, in the continental shelf. So it's a very, very precious element which is available in Pradesh. So just by looking at this chart, you know, I would eye on recovering manganese and magnesium and titanium from this material and vanadium if possible. You are getting the point. So, a strategy is set based on the chemical composition of the material and depends upon me. If I am an industrialist, I have my own unit, I can use this material for extraction of one thing. Yes, this is for a given sample. One third creating all samples. You, yes. take, you take five, six, ten samples and go for a statistical distribution and then create your strategy. That's not difficult, no? I can collect ten samples and I can analyze them. It's a matter of few hours. And in the, what is the amount we use in XRF? Amount of the oh. material like 4 this. grams. 4 grams. 4 grams. It's a quick test. Whenever you go to most of the chemical industries, ask them. I want to see your control room or the chemistry lab or the environmental lab. They will have all these units over there. Price is homogeneous material? Truly speaking, not. Then the 4, four grams, whatever I am taking for testing. It might give TAU2 much better for, than for blood samples, how much blood is taken out from your body. So basically they pass a pill and then whatever droplet comes, they just put them on the on the glass and then they just do the analysis, whole technique. Clear? So these are all indicators. So yeah, I know your question is correct, but the point is there's something known as statistical distribution of some number. I am very happy with one sample and if I have some doubt in my mind, I can take another sample and I can see what is the variation in the parameters. But in the same sample itself, uh, because of some local distribution errors, you know. So see, the idea is you are technologists, you are not mathematicians. Yeah. So a technologist goes ahead with some number. So I get 1.3, 2 percent doesn't matter. I will say minimum is 1.4 and maximum is 2 percent and then stop it. And for to decide minimum reduction, you have to make a lot of techniques. Correct. So it's not in places. It's not point not five, point not one, you know. So my eyes are on this. I want to extract this material. Now this is the focus of research in today's world. Take any material and try to extract the precious metals out of it. And that could be a very interesting R and D related entrepreneurship work. Because these type of industries don't exist anywhere. So India is importing most of the minerals and you know metallic compounds. Right. These materials are well discovered over the years, but nobody is putting their hands. That means it's very difficult to extract materials. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So, but as a technologist, we understand that this material has all these things in built in it, and I should do I should evolve a technique so that I can take out this fraction. So it might be in the equations where yeah, I'll, I'll give you an answer to your question. So if you have a very good friend from metallurgy, there are some techniques known as metallographic extraction of a metal. So you work up to the postcard. There are some bioinduced leaching of metals also from a material. Yeah. So you can have a specific bacteria which will take out a certain metal from this complex material and it will give you the desired output.
then these things have to be practiced. And they were not so practiced. are possible for a particular matter like this. Yeah. Correct. Running upon what you require. You have to create an environment in which that particular bacteria will grow and it will separate out the metal from the rest of the sludge. All, all metals or bacteria in this? I have not got in this area, but my idea says yes, it can be. If I haven't done research in this area. So that's why I said that you should collaborate with some metallurgists and biotechnologists, microbiologists, and doing all these things. But it is possible because literature says it is possible. Sir, anyways, in equations might be possible for, for developing a technology like what we have seen in the gas hydrates. We, we can say just take out and do, but it's not that much easy. No, nothing is easy. You have to make it easy. That's what it's all about technology says. So, right now, whatever appears to be difficult, impossible, what is your role? Why people will remember you? Because you made it possible, no? That's why people will say this guy was the the name of the method is called this. Based on your method. Based on your name. So do something like this. Otherwise, who will remember you? Yes? So the idea is there's enough scope of doing research which is application oriented. That's what the question was in the last lecture. How to use these techniques to derive something meaningful? Ash can be used in the cement industry. Why to put them in the why to put it in the lagoon? I told you there are two techniques of disposal. But the lagoon. Yeah, okay. So, one answer to your question is you know, most of the cement industries are not really interested in taking more than 40 percent. Transportation is a big problem. Quality of the fires is another problem, and so on. Logistics are a big problem. I think what he was talking about, Silica, by virtue of being a very fine particle, this material absorbs most of the moisture from the mix from the atmosphere. Unfortunately, most of the thermal power plants are close to water bodies. So the moment fly ash gets generated, it soft moisture. Where? That becomes a big issue. You can't put it in cement directly. So logistics are a big problem. Um, cost of you know carrying from one place to another place is a big problem. And all these things. It is being used. So first time I mean, I recommended more than 36 percent fly ash for even most of the buildings are 36 percent fly ash. Another entrepreneurship here would be, we were talking about the coarse fly ash, which is being disposed of in the pond. Crush it and make it ultra fine. So, do Google search and you will find that there is a lot of need and requirement for ultra fine materials, ultra fine particles. Because they are the best possible admixtures for concrete. If you want to create a system which is highly, you know, uh, durable, very high durability. Now, this is where the crushed ash in ultra fine form can be used as the best possible fillet. Which is very unfortunate, India mostly imports these type of materials because creating nanoparticles and Microparticles, all of these materials is a very tough task. It's not producing a mother uses. They are ultra fine. Yeah, I know. So there is a technique of you know creating ultra fine fraction out of the fly ash. So type it on the net, uh, they call it cyclones. You know, they have fly ash cyclones. So, under very high pressure of air, they pass fly ash particles and then this is what is known as segregation of the particles based on cyclones, cyclonic activity. Density wise. So, density separation you can do. Right? So, this is how you can create ultra fine particles. You know, the coarser fractions will come out, fine particles can come out, you can sell them in the market. So, in my opinion, this part of the Environmental geotechnics basically is highly, uh, can be highly commercialized. R&D leads to capital gain. And if R&D is not helping you in gaining capital gain, R&D should be phased. R&D should not remain only on paper.
I have given you a brief idea about what all can be done with this information. These are thinking topics and they are different kinds of course from the different from which type of very good. So now we have taken this session to a very different direction, entirely different direction. So this is a big issue. You know, there are so many big projects in India. Krishna Patam project you must have heard about because of the coal scam in the country. Closed almost after the lunching had uh, uh, formed in the hub. Unfortunately, in India, what's happening is that we are too much dependent upon the coal from very small countries. You know, we import most of the coal. Are you aware of this? It's a big shame for the nation. Most of the mines have been purchased by our big industrialists in the Soviet Union. So most of the coal which goes to the power plants is brought from Indonesia. Soft coal. This is how we get always the hard coal which has very low calorific value. It requires a lot of treatment. Coal beneficiation is a topic which a lot of chemical engineers for how to create more calories out of the coal which you are using. I can show you some of the slides that I went for one of the plants where coal washing is installed. Coal is washed and cleaned. That itself creates a lot of sludge which has to be disposed of safely. So near Korba there is a coal washing. And these are the issues which are forcing us to also rely on the pure technique. That means whatever amount of coal you bring, about 50% to 70% of the coal cannot be used. Now what to do with this residues is a big question. So if time permits, I will talk about this till the end of the lecture. I had done one consulting for Australian company in India and uh, we applied this course. So this is a very different coal topic which we are talking about. A good question. So depending upon the coal and its origin, your fly ash characteristics will change. So it, it, it will produce more energy. So good thing that so that means that ash content is less. But imagine you are bringing coal all the way from how many kilometers, and then you are paying royalty to the Indonesians. There is a reason, you know, the cost of the coal in our country is so high. So the entire economy is still revolving around these things. So all these things come under the realm of uh, environmental geotechnics, mining of coal. Mines which remain unattended become the source of contamination to the environment. Acid formation takes place. This is a town known as acid mine village. Acid formation occurs because of the pyrite oxidation. Acid dues. And then it results in sulfuric acid, which goes into the groundwater. So people who are from Ganbar and all the tourist kinds of India still highly polluted city will come. One of the reasons is too much of coal mining is being done and too much of acid is present in the groundwater. Now the question is what should I do? Should I stop mining and live like the way our forefathers are living without power? So from here itself the debate starts whether India should become nuclear power or not. Whether we should write up our summer power plants and create more nuclear power plants or not. So then the discussion in the parliament took place whether India should become nuclear power pollution or we should depend upon coal. What is economical? What is more sustainable? One more thing government had a tough time. Yes, so all these issues are techno, socio, commercial, political, whatnot. You remember my first day talk? These things become a part of the brand again. The idea of our discussion is we are just trying to give an exposure. We are not trying to make you experts at this moment, but we have full faith that one day you become an expert. So this is just an exposure we are giving you. It's a setting of mind which is going on. If you want to become an expert, you have to spend time, you should have intentions and you should have motivation. So 
for that there is no injection. I can't inject something in you. But believe me, whatever I speak here, I have learned after 15 years. I was a slow learner, very mediocre life. So I took 15 years to learn all these things which I have told you in 5 minutes. Because when I started doing my research, there was nothing available on those all these things. And people used to laugh at me. That's why I am working on all these issues. But these issues have become very contemporary now. Yeah, so before we start on this, uh, just add on about yeah, there's another method for finding out the uh, the elements present in a sample, in a liquid sample. It's known as ICP, inductively coupled plasma, the atomic emission spectroscopy, ICP AES. Sometimes Most of the civil engineering and what we do is dependent upon the best possible diagnostic tools. So there was a concept in civil engineering that everything is obsolete. People do not know that what is happening. Civil engineering is number one field, you know, as far as R and D is concerned and all other commercial research and material science is concerned, because we are the guys who utilize these instruments maximum. If you go to the safe in IIT Bombay, which is the kind of safe, I don't know how many of you are aware of it. It's sophisticated and advanced instrument system facility. The maximum uses of this facility are from civilian department. Though it is supposed to be the metallurgist who should be using that. And out of this, our lab uses it maximum. So any sample which comes from anywhere has to be first sent to diagnostic system. So this is what he was talking about ICP. Inductively coupled plus. Suppose you are given a sample, a water sample that you want to you want to check what are the impurities present in, in the sample, the elemental impurities. For example, if there are any contaminants present in the sample, then you can give it for ICP analysis. So ICP, you can only use liquid samples in ICP. Basically, the, uh, the liquid will pass through and it will get ignited under argon, uh, argon flame and then the plasma is detected and with respect to the standard, it's a complex procedure. So, so you can... metals which are, you know, uh, being uh, uh, supposed to be present in this, in this material are not present. This was a big project, you know, 10 years back, I think, must, uh, I must have done it. And the second issue is that the sludge which comes out of the Coca-Cola manufacturing, if you see that, I am sure you will stop telling this. <laughs> There also we showed in the solid phase as well as the liquid phase that there is no contamination present or whether contamination is present or not. So what he is talking about is a very advanced tool where if you want to find out contamination up to parts per billion or parts per trillion, PPP or PPT, normally we define PPM, parts per million. So up to this level you can detect contamination in any liquid phase of what he was talking about, you take drinking water and if you want to find out whether concentration of arsenic is enough or not, take the sample, find out arsenic content, iron content, calcium content, sodium content and so on. Now, one of the applications, the project which I am right now into is that if you go towards the Chandrapur area of uh, Maharashtra, you will find a lot of mines, a lot of mining activities is going on and particularly of the coal. The more and more you mine coal, as I said just now, open cast mine, a lot of pyrite gets oxidized. And this pyrite creates sulfuric acid. Now, this sulfuric acid migrates into the groundwater. Most of the river bodies which are present in this area are all contaminated. People are drinking this water. Fine. So, again, the question is should I stop mining? You know the consequences. Do more and more mining, you know the consequence. Clear? Suppose this uh, ICP, you are determining the heavy metal composition present in the sample and one of you asked, I think you asked about you know, how, how can you, can you determine for sure the exact amount in a sample if it is heterogeneous sample. But fly ash is a solid. 
which means you can't put it in ICP. So there's a technique where you can uh, digest the sample, which means that you will just heat it up with HF, hydrogen fluoride, HF, and then then you can mix, you can digest it into a liquid phase and then do the analysis. But again, that's a time consuming and energy intensive procedure. So it's not worth doing. So you can in fact do it, but we, we don't need so much of accuracy. Yeah. He was talking the previous lecture about this. Uh, he was talking about you know when you do nuclear explosions to test the potency of a nuclear weapon. One of the questions is that how much sand gets contaminated after explosion blows. Yes, and mm -hmm. open. So you you take the samples of the sand and then analyze them and find out what is the extent of contamination which is apparent because of radioactivity. Then another issue would be how to clean it up. Fly ash should not be seen as a perfectly uh, good material or it is not a magic material or anything. So it, it, it should also be tested to determine whether it has any uh, potential hazardous elements present in it, any heavy metal present in the sample or not. So we can uh, wash it with distilled water or deionized water and see if there is any kind of heavy metal leaching out or coming out of that sample and then we can do uh, run an ICP analysis on the sample to check whether the fly ash is uh, okay or not because we don't we, suppose we use it as a fill material we don't want it to leach out heavy metal, metals into the groundwater table right so uh, and plus you uh, sir talked about the acid mine drainage and sometimes the fly ash is also used to close the mines the mines that you uh, excavate you dump this fly ash back into those mines. Even then you have to check and see whether the, the fly ash is, uh, is a potential harmful uh, source or whether it is a, it's a inactive or inert material. Okay, I will just go to uh, the activation of uh, fly ash. Fly ash contains alumina and silica. Uh, you know any source of silica, any, any mineral that you know of? What? It's, one uh, of the most abundant uh, minerals. So it's uh, silica, basically silica, SiO2. Fly ash also quartz, as well as this silica in fly ash is not just present in the uh, mineral form, but also in some percentage in the amorphous form also. Uh, and also fly ash contains some other minerals present in it. So if we alter this fly ash, fly ash which contains both silica and alumina, if we alter this fly ash using an alkali, a strong alkali such as maybe sodium hydroxide or a potassium hydroxide. If you activate it, if you, mi if you mix it together then under suitable conditions of temperature and pressure then you get a mineral known as zeolite. You guys have heard of zeolite? Yeah, in the 1700s uh, one mineral, uh, Swedish mineralogist, he found a mineral which when heated started giving out steam. So he named it as zeolite, meaning a burning rock. So that's how the first the natural zeolites were discovered. And then scientists started uh, experimenting, experimenting on these, uh, uh, on different ways in which you can synthesize zeolites. And <clears throat> we have found that fly ash is also one source which you can use, a raw material that you can use for uh, creating zeolites. The picture of a fly ash, fly ash sphere or a spherule, you say. So what you are seeing is a scanning electron microscopy image. So we are going, we are zooming into the particle at se several, you know, hundred, thousands of times we are zooming into the particle. So this is, you can see the scale there, <coughs> it's written uh, 100 nanometers there. So you are zooming into the particle and this is how a fly ash particle looks like. So when you treat it with an alkali, maybe uh, NaOH or KOH, this is what happens uh, to the fly ash. Basically the fly ash sphere gets etched by the alkali. The alkali starts, the alkali a caustic uh, soda, uh, NaOH. When it, when it acts upon this fly ash, the top portion of the fly ash starts getting etched. So it starts dissoluting into the solution phase. And slowly the fly, uh, the silica and alumina which was previously present in the mineral phase in the fly ash starts going into the solution phase and finally it crystallizes. 
to form zeolites. So you can see zeolites which are uh, parked on top of some of the unreacted fly ash particles in this SEM image. Yes. See what also happens to the particle size of the fly ash after activation. If you see the particle size, you can see the scale, the difference in the scales of the of the images. So the particle size starts decreasing drastically, right? So which means that you get more area also. When the particle size decreases, effectively you have more amount of surface area available. 
so <clears throat> which means there are more parking spaces for the uh, for the heavy metals or any other cations which the uh, zeolite uh, starts interacting with and uh, zeolite also has a very interesting property which is known as uh, cation exchange mechanism or the cation exchange capacity of the material. So, here the material has a particular number of cations which are available for exchange with other cations. So, suppose we have some contaminants say you have cesium, lead, nickel, cobalt, cadmium name it suppose you have a few cations like that and suppose those cations are interacting with this zeolite what happens is zeolite already has some harmless cations such as sodium or calcium so or potassium and magnesium. So, when these cations they are they interacted with the zeolite they start entering into the zeolitic matrix they start replacing the, the native cations which were previously present in the zeolite. So, this makes it a valuable uh, potential material for use as a sorbent for removal of uh, heavy metals and other contaminants uh, for effluent treatment for water treatment purpose for soil remediation. Suppose you have a contaminated soil and you want to treat the soil how do you treat it? Suppose you have only superficial contamination in the soil you can probably mix the zeolite with the fly ash. So, that the fly ash will so, so that the zeolite will start uh, trapping these heavy metals into its matrix and so that it does not leach out of its system uh, and go down into the water uh, into the ground water. So, there are various ways in which you can uh, synthesize zeolites from fly ash basically uh, the typical method is the one that I told you about it is called the hydrothermal method the other method we have attended all these methods by the way. So, in case you need our help uh, I will charge you but I will give the technology. So, you can treat the uh, fly ash with an alkali and fuse it at high temperature 550 degrees or 600 degrees and then you can uh, synthesize zeolites out of it uh, another way is treated uh, with my microwave radiations.
And all that time to solve several thermal power plants. The rest clear as mentioned. We are following reverse cycle. We want to get rid of thermal power plant and we want to adopt nuclear power plant. This is how we learn. Now the method is the ultrasonication assisted method. So ultrasonic waves at very high frequency, you uh, disturb the sample and then you cause activation with uh, the alkali. The molten salt method is a dry method of synthesizing zeolites where you mix uh, salt and an alkali with the fly ash and fuse it to get the zeolite. So, Just a minute, this is also known as green cement by the way. If you, if you take a polonic material and mix it with hydroxides, clear? It's nothing but a green cement or a green concrete. Environment friendly. Most of the Roman structures were done about 2000 years back <laughs> or how many years back? 2000 approximately. 2000. You go to Rome, you, you won't find all use simple common sense polonic material mixed with alkali. And that is standing there for the last 2000 years. This is Rome, once I met Anonymous, whatever they have done. The first thing, the whole Roman Empire is based on zeolites. No cement they have used anywhere. There is a map which shows the various uses of flash based zeolites. Uh, you can see AMD acid mine drainage applications, then it can be used for removal of anions, which are, uh, can you name some of the harmful anions, which are not desired, maybe in water, sulphates then, chlorides, phosphates, nitrates, yeah. So you don't, yeah, so these are all found in the wastewater. So if you, you, can, you can use these zeolites for cleaning. You can also mix the fertilizer with the uh, zeolite so that the fertilizer won't start uh, leaching out fast. It, the zeolite will prevent the fast leaching of the fertilizer. So you can control it within the root zone itself. Yeah. So that, that application of the zeolite is known as control release fertilizer application, control release fertilizer, CRF they call it. Yeah, for di in, in dyeing industry, uh, the effluents contain, what do they contain? Heavy metals, yes. And also anions also, it contains anions also, phosphates. <coughs> so these also need to be cleaned up. And that's why uh, these uh, textile industries, they have very strict norms regarding the discharge of their effluents. And uh, also for heavy metal, Removal that we already discussed in detail. PRBs and liners. PRB, it's one of the most recent uh, research areas. Permeable reactive barriers. Suppose you have a contaminant spill somewhere on the ground. So, if there is a contaminant spill on the ground, what happens when rain occurs? When it rains? Yeah. So, the rainwater starts interacting with the contaminant and the contaminant starts percolating. And finally, it enters the groundwater. So you don't want that to happen. So in order to prevent it, there is something that you can make, a barrier that you can make in the soil. So you will dig a long trench. And in, into this trench, you will put suitable sorbent material, which will trap these contaminants and allow only the, the clean uh, solution to pass through it. So that is known as a permeable reactive barriers. So they are permeable in one sense, at the same time they are also barriers of these contaminants. See, crop rotation, normally villagers do, is a good example of creating zeolites. Because crop rotation is the fire residues of the crop. 
and what are the mass on the field is nothing but the ash. And this ash, by virtue of very high temperature of firing, becomes a zero light. So that's why they say after every crop, you know, you rotate the crop and then you fire whatever residues are, mix it with the soil, that itself becomes like a nutrient. Or it's a, it's a good manure. We will not use chemicals to increase the uh, vitality of the soil. These are the practices which our villagers know much better than us. For the liner material, so nuclear waste repositories for where contaminant uh, containment, nuclear waste containment, the liners that you use, even for landfills, um, MSW landfills on which Agnes is working on. So the landfill liners, you can use a zeolitic material for uh, for preventing the uh, escape or the transport of contaminants from the landfill into the surrounding soil. Zeolitic t-shirts. Have you seen that? No. Yeah, there's a whole company in US now. They are super athletes. They are creating the zeolitic t-shirts because it reacts with your sweat. The best possible cooling effect to the body. More stamina. Is it not? And you are air conditioned all this. So this also the diet. Another one is the treatment of wastewater. There are different types of wastewaters. What are the types that you know of? Industrial, yes. What's the difference between a domestic wastewater and industrial wastewater? Because of detergents and. Yeah, there are different types of wastewater. 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 Another thing is VOCs, volatile organic compounds. So, some of the volatile organic compounds which are present, organic ones, inorganic ones. So, these can be trapped, these gases can be trapped using zeolites. Uh, we in parking lots, you have, uh, you have a, the basements, you will have contaminants present, the gases present. Yeah, in order to trap those gases, you can use uh, these. Oil spills, I have taught in the class, oil slicks, oil spills. If you want hmm. to stop it, the best possible thing is zeolites. Yeah. Some of the characterization methods, there are second year students also here, right? So characterization is basically anything that you uh, do on the material, you experiment on the material, try to find out its properties, the different properties. For example, for a, a human being, you try to characterize him based on him or her based on height and uh, what not. Hmm. So, in the, same, in the same way, any material that you have, that also you can start characterizing it. And so, that will give an indication of what that material is. In other words, you don't need to physically tell, you don't need to tell based on what you see externally, but based on what you see in some other ways also. For example, chemical composition, you can't see it. But if you give that to a person who knows um, about it, if you give the, those results to him, he can tell you. He or she can tell you how what what's peculiar about that material, and can even suggest you applications related to that. So some of the physical characterization include the particle size distribution. So in other words, you find out what are the different uh, particle sizes that are present in the sample, and and how much percentage of uh, each particle size is present in the sample. Specific surface area, the surface area for material. Surface area you can find out using different methods. One of the methods is the uh, BET method, nitrogen adsorption method. So here you use nitrogen gas uh, as an adsorbent and, and you find out what is the surface area of that material. You see, you see a lot of hospitals and most of the localities, but you don't see any metal characterization lab in any locality. Only metal characterization is created a metal characterization lab at least in, in every city of India. Really? It's a very good investment. You know? Because those of you who want to become a good entrepreneur, create a good metal characterization lab. The instruments are not so very compact. And one who can arrange everything. Specific gravity of material, you can find out in our lab we use the uh, he helium pycnometer. 
So you, we use the helium display helium displacement method to determine the specific gravity. Chemical characterization we already discussed XRF the cation exchange capacity CEC and uh, another technique is the FTIR technique where you find out the structural bonding present in the sample. Uh, what are the different bonding bonding patterns in the sample? The chemical bonding, the uh, silica oxygen bonding, the OH bonding present. So based on uh, when you do a do an FTIR analysis on the sample, you get uh, the uh, spectrograph, and then from that you can know based on the bands that you get, you can know what type of bonding is present in the sample. So if you suppose you are altering the sample using some chemical means, you can check whether the alteration has occurred and what type of new product has formed, what type of new bonding is has developed in the sample based on this FTIR. XRD, this is one of the most useful tools that we have, uh, X-ray diffraction analysis. X-ray diffraction analysis helps to determine what are the minerals present in a sample or to know how much percentage of the material is in the in the mineral phase and how much of it is in the amorphous phase that you can know using uh, an X-ray diffraction analysis. So basically we are finding out the crystal structures that are present in the sample and we already know what is some of the standards standard crystals. So we will compare this x-ray diffraction pattern that we are getting with respect to the standard crystal patterns that we have and we can know what kind of crystals are there in our material, what type of minerals are there, whether there is quartz in it or, or montmorillonite in it or elite or smectite, smectite or uh, you can know what type of zeolite is present in the sample. All these you will get to know by doing an XRD analysis. The uh, morphological characterization, in other words, what is the morphology, what is the superficial features that are present in the sample, we can know using the uh, SEM, the scanning electron microscopy. So there are different different types of SEMs also, we even have a, uh, a cryo SEM, in other words you can uh, conduct a scanning electron microscopy under cryogenic conditions where you do not want uh, the, uh, the material to change at all. So and you can do a, a FEXM. FEG, field emission gun uh, scanning electron microscopy, FXM and also, so we have all those facilities in IIT. Uh, so if you do that you can even, you, know, in, you can have a probe, a, a, a tiny probe which will examine what is the elemental composition present on a sample as well as give you an image of the sample at the same time, you can, you can <coughs> know this. Basically this is how uh, a, a, an XRD result looks like, but I have superimposed uh, six XRD images in, in one graph. So <coughs> these, uh, uh, when you put a material, a solid into an uh, XRD uh, machine, the X-ray beams bombard on the sample and <coughs> based on, you know, the Bragg's law, what is that? Bragg's law, 2D sin theta, yeah. So, so this uh, X-ray diffraction analysis uh, follows this uh, principle of uh, principle and then we get these patterns. So these patterns you see peaks appearing at different locations with respect to the variation in the theta, the 2 theta value, you get different peaks. So that around 26 degrees past 26, yeah, you get quartz peak, that is a quartz peak. So if you get uh, multiple, based on the peaks that you get, you will compare it with respect to the standard peaks and you can know what are the different minerals present in it. It is very important for us as, as far as uh, a mineralogist is concerned. You can, you can de determine whether a sample that you have has some minerals present in it, has some precious minerals present in it or not. And as far as we are concerned, we, are, we can also know whether there is any alteration in the, in a material. Suppose uh, we are activating the sample of uh, fly ash and you want to see whether new minerals have formed, you can check using this XRD. So coming back to your question about silica, if I have more peaks distinct, then what will Even silica would have 
active and passive forms. So this is how you can differentiate between what type of forms of silica are present in the system. So calcium will react with the amorphous phase, not with the crystal phase. So it's not calcium No. The calcium comes from the pole. The calcium and triad come from the pole. Clear? Gypsum. Clear? So that calcium is in the free form. So the moment you add this something and add water, this calcium hydrates. And hydration gives you if the system is amorphous, gel formation. And the gel is nothing but the concrete. So anyway, the point was that how to differentiate between crystalline and amorphous materials of the silica itself. So looking at the peaks, you can realize whether it is crystalline or non-crystalline. As he is saying, cement. I think he is talking about cement because in cement we use triads and the triad is the major source for active silica. So where there we are not counting for the calcium. There the calcium is coming from gypsum which is included in cement. See your whole definition of concrete is wrong, unfortunately. What is the role of triage in concrete? Please understand this first. Clear? Triage is an inert material. It's used as a filler material. The fraction of the triage which is amorphous or the glassy phase which is known as that is only going to form a chemical reaction. Clear? That is what is known as CCS or CS. So most of the time these particles of triage act as a filler. The logic is given they are the ball bearings. So they just make the system more fluidly. They are logically controlled. So they are filler materials. The water base can be used as filler, but why fresh? The only difference between both of them is their particle size and surface area, nothing else. But sir, for uh, cement, we are using because uh, triage contributes in secondary hydration. Right. Uh, that's why it reacts with calcium hydroxide of cement. Please, please. So secondary hydration is start of the second time. Where uh, all the hydroxides which are present in the system, they start attacking on the silica. Yeah. And silica leaches out. Yeah. Silica reacts with it. Silica leaches out from the crystalline matrix. And then this forms the bond. So it's also very interesting. So you require very high pH, where silica gets dissolved. And this silica, when it comes out of the crystalline phase, then only it forms a gel. Crystalline form will not react even in basic uh, form. No, uh -huh. the crystalline form will react with the basic form slowly and slowly after a second time. But how do you decide the amorphous silica? Uh, how would you make amorphous silica, first of all? So you are right, some part of the triage could be amorphous silica, which acts.